Hey guys, with only a month to go until the trial in the Delphi case, motions are going to be coming in thick and fast. And Richard Allen's defence team's latest motion is one to suppress some quote-unquote evidence. All right, so what is this latest motion? Well, Defendant Richard M. Allen by counsel Bradley A. Rosie respectfully requests that this court suppress as evidence in this cause any and all oral and written communications, confessions, statements or admissions alleged to have been made by Defendant Allen during his pre-trial detention in this cause. In support of this motion, Defendant Allen states the following. Defendant Allen is charged with two counts of felony murder and two counts of murder. During the course of Defendant Allen's pretrial detention, it's alleged that Defendant Allen communicated incriminating statements to state actors and or their agents, all of which the state of Indiana intends to present to a jury at the trial in this cause. The statements were involuntary and thus obtained in violation of the following 5th Amendment, 6th Amendment, 14th Amendment and Article 1, Sections 12, 13 and 14 of the Indiana Constitution. The statements sought to be suppressed were obtained as a result of psychological and or mental coercion illegally directed against the defendant and such statements were therefore involuntarily given. The statements sought to be suppressed were obtained as a result of physical coercion illegally directed against the defendant and such statements were therefore involuntarily given. Therefore, any and all communications, confessions, statements or admissions alleged to have been offered up by Defendant Allen were elicited in violation of his constitutional rights, 5th, 6th and 14th Amendment and the uh, Indiana Constitution sections previously stated. Wherefore, Defendant Allen by counsel respectfully requests this court conduct pre-trial hearing to determine if the statements alleged to have been given were voluntary in nature and suppress as evidence in this cause any and all communications, confession statements or admissions written or oral made by him subsequent to his arrest. Okay, all right, let's have a look at the memorandum. So... We've got some facts. I'm not going to read this word for word. We know the facts. We know all about the way Richard Allen was treated in Westville. We've heard about that, not only from Bradley Rosie and Andrew Baldwin, but also from William Labrato and Robert Scramming, the interim attorneys. So we're going to read the analysis. And it tells us, all about these confessions that Richard Allen is alleged to have made about the murders of Abigail Williams and Liberty German, the murders that the state says Richard Allen committed, and people who believe that Richard Allen is guilty, the thing that they throw, number one, like a flamethrower, they throw it thinking it's a slam dunk. Well, hmm. not only did um, Elvis Fields confess with information that we now know to be accurate about the murder scene, you wouldn't know what that murder scene looked like unless you were actually there. And it appears that Richard Allen might not have been there because the confession that he gave, supposedly, factually incorrect. You see, that's one of the reasons why cops don't give away details of crime scenes, because there are weirdos out there who will confess to crimes, especially like if they're quite notorious. People love doing a, a good false confession. Now, it takes up a lot of time, and, you know, it's difficult to... If you've just released all the information that there is about the crime scene, it's difficult to weed out these false confessions from anyone who actually might have been there. And if someone confesses to a crime and it's factually incorrect, they can't have been there, can they? 
Notwithstanding the lower standard for showing involuntary and set by the Indiana Constitution, it's indisputable that Allen's detention circumstances were manufactured by the Carroll County Sheriff purposefully and without the existence of any sense of due process, as the court signed the safekeeping order without requiring the state to establish the burden of proof required by the statute. But this was just the beginning. Allen was then shipped off and immediately placed on suicide watch in a detention cell where he had little to no accommodations, even those offered up to the other 2,000 convicted inmates, convicted inmates housed across the prison yard. Almost simultaneously with Allen's isolation from human contact, prison companions were placed at his doorstep and tasked with the duty of reporting his every move and recording his every word. The companions appear to have gone above and beyond this duty by communicating with Alan about his case and even praying with him as he struggled to withstand the rigours of his incarceration. The mere presence at his doorstep, <laughs> doorstep is akin to uh, Messiah versus United States where police obtained incriminating statements from a jailhouse informant who engaged the defendant in a conversation and developed a relationship of trust and confidence with the defendant such that he revealed incriminating information about the charged crime when counsel was not present. The court held that this was improper and suppressed the statements. This trial court should do the same. The trial court's decision regarding admissibility of a confession or incriminating statements is controlled by determining from the totality of the circumstances, whether the statement was given voluntarily rather than being induced through violence, threats, coercion or other improper influence so as to overcome the defendant's free will. Standard indicators of voluntariness voluntariness oh, yeah include whether the confession was freely self-determined the product of a rational intellect and free will without compulsion or inducement of any sort and whether the accused will was overborne here alan's free will was overcome by the forces of his environment all of which were placed upon him by the government and its actors. Alan, a man with bona fide pre-existing mental health issues, was detained in an isolation cell, entirely isolated from any sense of meaningful human contact, and then offered up the most basic amenities of life through a cuff port, which is a hole in his door. He was reduced to sleeping on a mattress that was placed on top of a steel plate just a few inches from the floor. This same mattress and floor also doubled as his dining table because his cell had no such accommodation. I don't actually think cells have dining tables. <laughs> I don't think they do. They have like a little table, maybe. All right, not, not really a dining table, is it? All right. His attire was reduced to nothing more than a suicide smock covering only a portion of his body. Alan's healthiest accommodations came in the form of recreation time, not to exceed four hours per week. In this space, there was not enough room to jog or run, only an exercise bike and a pull-up bar. Alan's other accommodation would have been a window slit. That was inside his cell. His view of anything outside of the boundaries of the penitentiary would have been impaired by the rusty chain link and razor wire of at least two separate fences between him and any sense of freedom. Well, he is incarcerated, so there's that. To the extent Alan was ever allowed to be removed from his cell, he was shackled at the ankles, wrists and further confined by a belly chain and a cuff port and guided around the prison on a leash all ideal ways to confine and control the movements of a convicted killer or some other convict who, in addition to his conviction, posed a threat to himself or the prison staff. Yeah, the average the average criminal isn't led about like that in a prison. Like you have to be like Hannibal Lecter, you know, to be led about like that in a prison. Alan is five foot five, hundred and seventy three pounds soaking wet, and with not one single criminal conviction on his rap sheet. Met none of these conditions. As if this treatment wasn't enough, Alan was forced to endure the intimacies of his restraint systems even while he was meeting with his court-appointed lawyers inside the confines of the maximum security segregation unit located inside of the Westville Correctional Facility. To add insult to injury, Alan's meetings with his attorneys occurred while he had a video camera aimed at his face, recording sessions that should have been afforded the most private of environments so as to protect the relationship between attorney and client. That's shocking that that happened. 
All of this occurred while Alan's medications were being adjusted, quote unquote, by the prison medical team, the combination of which factors reduced him to nothing more than a human experiment. Alan's free will was overcome. Dear God. Dear God. All right. Under the Indiana Constitution, the voluntariness of a confession must be proved beyond a reasonable doubt. And in reviewing voluntariness, the courts look upon the totality of circumstances, reviewing all the evidence in the record, rather than focus only on the evidence supporting the finding of voluntariness. Under the US Constitution, the prosecution only has to prove by preponderance of the evidence that the confession was voluntary. As explained below, the state cannot meet its burden showing voluntariness here, even applying the lower standard. The federal courts have a long history of regulating the admission of confessions that have been a product of state action that exploits the weak and compromised through interrogatory and custodial processes. Okay, so we've got some more law here, right. Allen's case falls within these federal parameters. In Blackburn, the defendant had a documented history of mental illness, having served in the military, which ultimately resulted in his discharge because of a medical finding that he had suffered from some form of psychosis. He was in the process of being treated in the days and weeks leading up to the commission of the crime and his ultimate apprehension. After enduring an 8-10 to 10 hour interrogation, Blackburn was given a prepared written statement with admission offered up by him in the course of his interrogation ultimately signed the written statement two days later. Here, Alan endured a longer, more sustained form of interrogation, one that lasted more than five months before he finally broke. Already suffering from a bona fide mental health disorder and then having been cut off from the moral support of his wife, mother and daughter, Alan was weakened to the point where he slipped into a state of psychosis plagued with grossly disorganised, delusional, paranoid. Yeah, well, you're not paranoid if they're out to get you. Hmm. And highly dysfunctional behaviour. These behaviours were manifested through verbal confessions that he may have been drugged. Well, he may have been drugged. He was being drugged. Verbal confessions to the double homicide, inconsistent with known facts about the crime scene. Come on to that in a minute. Periods of not sleeping for days, paranoia, as we've said, stripping off his clothes, drinking toilet water, covering himself with and eating his own feces and many other socially unacceptable behaviours. And here comes the confession. On one occasion, Alan confessed to molesting those two girls and shooting them in the back. On another occasion, he proffered his sorrow for molesting Abby and Libby and others, which he specifically named. These facts are known to be falsities, none of which are supported by the autopsy findings by Dr. Roland Corr as to the cause of death of the girls and unsupported by the absence of any evidence that either one of the girls was sexually assaulted near or before the time of their death. At the time Alan uttered these falsities, the state actors were in the ready position with pen in hand documenting the entirety of Alan's mental and physical deterioration and actions stemming therefrom. The infringement on Alan's legal rights did not stop here. Inmate Companion then spread the good word of Alan's confessions to inmates in general pop prompting those inmates to then share the information with their respective family members in public. Proof of these leaks were offered up by the state in the form of audio recorded interviews and accompanying transcripts and included in large volumes of discovery dumps received by the defence in the recent past. However, neither Alan nor his legal team were aware of any self-reporting of said leaks by the state to the defence or by the state to the court despite the fact that the state were aware of this information as early as May 12, 2023 when these inmates were interviewed by law enforcement investigators, Alan's due process rights have been all but ignored. So, you guys, Richard Allen thinks that um, Libby and Abby were essayed and shot in the back. They weren't. The stuff that Elvis Fields said, though, 
Yeah, that was true. 